Howdy everyone, I'm Michael Perch. I'm an associate professor at the University of Texas at Austin and I record all my lectures and put them online to support my students, working professionals, and maybe even inspire those who could be interested to do STEM to join us. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. I haven't recorded for a while. I've been super busy getting course content ready for the fall term. But I thought I'd throw in a video because while preparing course content, and I'm excited, looking forward to the class on machine learning, subsurface machine learning, I realized that there was kind of a paucity of discussion around the idea of model fitting, overfitting, and model generalization. So I put together a nice little example. I figured I'd record it and just put it up and have it as a resource to share. Let's give ourselves a very, very simple problem. We have a petrophysical problem. To those of you who are not aware of or know about petrophysics, we're simply talking about the ability to build a tool that can indirectly make measurements about rock using rock physics. Okay, so in this case, we have a tool that is going to be able to measure rock density, and we want to be able to convert that into rock porosity because porosity can be used in all kinds of types of subsurface models including groundwater and other resources like oil and gas. Okay so we want to be able to build this model. We want a rock porosity model from well log density for a specific rock type sandstone. Okay so that's our problem. So what does it look like if we actually visualize that problem? Not a big deal. Pretty straightforward. We have a two rock units. The sandstone unit is the one that we're right now concerned about. And it is shown here as this anticline kind of a structure where we have it bending, folding, mounting up like that and coming back down again. And this axis right here is the elevation. This axis is a offset horizontally. So we are looking at a cross section of the rock just to illustrate the problem. Now imagine if you're omniscient you would be able to observe the entire population of the problem and there'd be no need to model. That would be a wonderful thing, right? You would be able to look at all possible locations over the sandstone unit where we perfectly measured the density and the porosity. We put every bit of rock through the lab and or you had superhuman vision and you could see porosity, which would be epic. And now you're able to take all of that data, imagine billions or trillions of samples that just define this shape right here. With perfect accuracy, no error. You would see that relationship. There'd be no need to model once again. Well, we don't have that. We don't have that. And that's, this is where our troubles are going to begin for us, is instead we have this. We have a limited set of samples. Now, when I teach my classes, I often use the phrase, we have about one trillionth volumetrically of the population, the subsurface sampled. About one trillionth of it. Okay, so imagine very sparse sampling. Now, what we need to do is we need to be able to go ahead and build this model. Now, what we're typically going to do, the way we can get by with this idea of one trillion sampled is we're not just using the data. We'll often use our knowledge of the geosciences, the engineering. We're going to build a model with physics, with our domain expertise, and we'll hinge it on the limited sample data, and we'll be able to build a pretty good model. Now, let's not do that. We're not going to address the integration of geoscience and engineering, the physics of the problem right now, not, not for this discussion. Let's focus on the data-driven approach. We want to build a good, best model, the relationship between the predictor feature, density, the response feature, porosity. And we want to be able to do that so that we can make these predictions going forward. Every time we make a measurement with a well log of a density, I want to be able to convert that to porosity. Then I know how much groundwater I have and so forth. Okay, so that's the problem we have right now. That's what we're going to try to do. And once again, we just have limited samples from the sandstone to accomplish that. What we're going to do with predictive machine learning methodologies is we're going to go ahead and train a model and tune it. And that model is going to be able to take us from the predictor feature through some type of a transform to the output from density to porosity. We're going to separate the data into two groups. I'm just showing the very the simplest type of approach here of training and testing. The training data are used to train the model parameters that will fit the model. 
and the testing data are withheld. Take them away, throw them away, don't peek at them, and we're going to use them to tune the hyperparameters. That will control the complexity of the model. Now, if you look here, you look at the data that we had in our setting. I turned some of it into testing data. It's green. And if you look at this relationship, this dark line is the true model that we don't have now. In fact, I should probably just get rid of that. I don't have that. Hey, look, this has become a multimedia extravaganza now. Don't actually have that function available to us. All we have are these dots. Okay, so we're going to have to try to fit that model. What we'll do is we're going to go ahead and build that exhaustive model that can represent those predictions of porosity from a minimum to a maximum density value. We're going to have to accept that there's a range of applicability. This model, we will not be training it to act out here, and we will not expect it to be able to work with negative density, which wouldn't be possible or physically plausible. So we want to be able to build a model that will be able to do a pretty good job. Now, so what we can do is we could build a very simple model. The simplest model I can ever think of is lin linear regression. I just do a linear regression. And when I do that, I get the best line fit through the training data. And if I calculate the error in training, the yellow PDF here, it's okay. It's not great. It's the, clearly the phenomenon, the natural phenomenon is not linear. The model's too simple. We have a higher degree of model bias but not too bad. We have the testing data. We do a bit poorer. We often do worse with testing. It was not used to train the model. And we get a slightly wider distribution there. Now we could increase the complexity of the model. If we do that, then we get a model that's more curvilinear and it's able to fit the natural setting better. And the distribution in training, the error training goes down, the variance goes down, it's better, lower error, and testing also goes down in this case, and we're doing pretty good. So what can we say in general? Well, as expected, a more complicated model is fitting better. We're doing fine. It, we're doing really well. And the good news is, so far, it generalizes really, really quite well away, away from the data. Because remember, we're looking at the natural setting. You see that light gray line. It's there. The truth is there. And we're doing pretty good generalization. We can make pretty good predictions away from the data that was used to train the model. And that's what we're testing when we use the withheld testing data. And that distribution is looking pretty narrow too. Life is looking good. Why do we start to fall into issues with overfit and loss of model generalization? This is the problem right here. We don't have error-free measures. We have samples with error. That's our fundamental problem that we have. Error in the measurement of the predictor feature well log measure. So in other words, this axis right here, there's error. In fact, I could have drawn arrows going like here and here and here. But th those individual measures that we had, the gray dots were the measures without error. They had error, and that error horizontally was in the predictor feature. The error in the vertical direction is with regard to the response feature that we must have measured. We must have, to build this plot, we must have extracted core samples and actually done porosity calculations to get the measures on this axis, and that's the error. Instead of having these error-free values, we have these values right here that have error. That's our problem. Okay, now you'll notice that the linear regression model, it changed. It's not doing as well. The error in training is much higher. And the distribution in testing is a bit higher yet further, but it's not terrible. Now, the simple model is less sensitive to error and noise in the data. It, in fact, performs better. This is when we get into the discussions around model variance and sensitivity to data. Lower complexity models have lower model variance. With complexity, we have ability to learn the natural system better. We have more flexibility to fit complicated forms, but that is a two-edged sword because we now have better flexibility to fit error. And so look at our complicated model. It is perfectly accurate at the training data. Look at that. It's passing right through all of those yellow dots. No matter how much error we put on them, it's fitting that error. But look at what happens with the testing data and imagine how this model would perform in real world use. The distribution of error in testing is very high. The model has begun to 
with flexibility, better fit noise, and the model now is poor at generalization away from the training data. It's doing a pretty bad job of fitting the natural phenomenon away from the training data. Okay, so that's low generalization now overfits models. This is looking pretty poor now. There's another step we could go when we're talking about generalization. We ask ourselves the question of how far away from training can you go with the model? What is the extent or limit of our ability to generalize our model? I already mentioned the idea of going very, very high density or very low density outside the range of the training data, which would also be working our way out onto a cantilever for sure, and we'd start to lose accuracy, I'd guess, I would assume. But now imagine that limestone unit. We did all that training and testing up until now with, with the sandstone unit. Now imagine the case in which I say, well, I built a rock model. I'm doing fine. That's all rock. I'm going to assume a big assumption of stationarity. It's all the same stuff. Now imagine the difference. Now the limestone truth model would look something like that, perhaps, depending, of course, on the rock lithology and so forth. But it could look something like that. The sandstone model looked like that. And you can imagine now we're in a situation where we have a significant level of bias. Our model is just quite incorrect. And so there are, of course, limits for the congruous application of our machines. We must be consistent in training and testing and real world use of the model. And I, as someone who originally came from the area of geostatistics, I always think about stationarity over what volume can I assume what metrics are consistent? Let's go ahead and just put a more formal definition of overfit together. When we're talking about overfit, we're talking about more model complexity, flexibility than can be justified with the available data, data accuracy, frequency, the amount of data, and the coverage of the data. To what degree do we cover the range over which we'd like to make predictions and the combinations of all the predictor features? Another point, model explains idiosyncrasies. I love this definition of the data, capturing data, noise, and error in the model. And a high accuracy in training, but low accuracy in testing. So the real world use away from training data classes is not going to have high accuracy. We have poor ability for the model to generalize. All right, so that's it. That was my discussion around model fitting, overfitting, and generalization with a little bit of a tie back to a subsurface example. I hope this was useful to you. I'm Michael Perch. I'm an associate professor at the University of Texas at Austin. I record all my lectures and put them online in the hope of supporting people interested in learning about science, technology, engineering. And um, I hope this is helpful to you. Everybody stay safe. Okay.